The last section on the first test is measures of relative standing, where we're going to look at z scores, percentiles, five number summaries, and box plots. So where we're going to start is talking about percentiles. There's two ways the question can be asked. It can be asked as what data point represents the peak percentile, or what percentile is the data point x represent in our ordered list. Both questions assume that we can take our raw data and place it into an ordered list, the same way we did identify the mean previously. So whenever any of these position functions are used, it's assumed it's from the ordered list, not the random list that began. You need to make sure it's going smallest to greatest when we talk about using these position functions. So to answer a question like what data point represents the peak percentile, the way that we're going to do that is take the location of a data point equals the number of data points times the peak percentile divided by 100. Where L is the location in the ordered list, N is the total number of data points, and P is the percentile I'm looking for. If I get something like the second question, what percentile is the data point X? To find that percentile, we take what the location is in the ordered list of the data point divided by n data points that there are times 100 to find the percentile. All the letters mean the same thing in the second equation. Really, using algebra, I can go from the first equation to the second equation just by rearranging them. That said, I think it's better to understand them as two separate equations. The location of a certain percentile is found using this formula. The percentile of a certain data point is found using this formula. So if I was asked, let's say I have the data set 18, 9, 16, 28, 8, 11, 22. And I want to find what data point represents the 80th percentile within this data set. And then I want to find what percentile the data point 11 is. The very first thing I always have to do is order this from least to greatest. So I see the smallest number is 8, then 9, then 11, 16, 18, 22, 28. I rearrange in this order. For the first question, finding the percentile, the location of where we're looking for the 80th percentile. The location is returned by taking n, in this case we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 data points, so 7 times the percentile we're looking for, which is 80, divided by 100. This tells us 5.6 is the location of the 80th percentile. If we're trying to do 5.6, I'm going to round up to 6. We're not going to round when we go to do quartiles in the future, but for questions like these, I like to point to a specific data point. <coughs> so since the 6 is 5 or higher, I'm going to round up and say what we're looking for is the 6th data point in the ordered list. The 6th data point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, is this data point 22. So the 80th percentile is 22. <coughs> when we look at it the other way, if we want to find what percentile is the data point 11, we first have to say what location is it in the ordered list. It's 1, 2, 3, the third number in the ordered list. There's a total of 7 numbers in the list. So we put 3 divided by 7 times 100. 3 divided by 7 times 100 gives me 42.86 we're about the 43rd percentile. <coughs> we can split data into four quartiles, basically taking it instead of where the median splits it, 50% below, 50% above. Four quartiles split it. Here's Q1 with 25% below, 75% above. <coughs> Q2 means the same thing as the median. 50% below, 50% above, and Q3 has 75% below, 25% above. So these are in the middle of these quartiles, where basically Q1 separates the bottom 25% from the top 75%. It's also sometimes called QL for the lower quartile. Q3 separates the bottom 75 from the top 25. It's also sometimes called QU for the upper quartile. This last piece of information is somewhat important. They might ask you about the interquartile range. To find the interquartile range, you take your value that you found for Q3 minus your value that you found for Q1. 
The inner quartile range really contains the middle 50% of gait. You might wonder why that's important. Really, there are certain tasks where the middle 50% of the data could be more interesting to you. Specifically, when I used to teach high school, they looked at the grades that students got on um, standardized tests, and they really judged teachers based on that middle 50%. The thinking was the bottom 25% might not be as reflective of the teacher because they might have gotten some students who were behind when they came in. Same thing with the top 25%, the ones that did very well on the test, it was kind of assumed that they were the brighter kids, I shouldn't even say bright, they were the kids who were better prepared when they came to the class and didn't necessarily reflect the teacher helping them as much as it reflected where they were coming in. So that bottom and top end were both kind of ignored for those reasons whereas the middle 50% of the data really told the tale of what was going on in that classroom, at least according to my bosses at the time. So there could be certain instances where you really want to focus on the middle of the data on the inner quartile range between Q3 and Q1. So our book uses the percentile formula to calculate to find quartiles. I gotta be honest, it's the thing I hate most about our book. So when we switch to send gauge, I love a lot of aspects of it. I really think that the online system is a great interface. I think it's been a lifesaver as far as me having used it previously to switching to trying to uh, adjust to a pandemic. And now that I am very used to the online system, I absolutely love it. But I wish they would change these quartile rules. The way that I'm used to calculating quartiles is by splitting the data using the median then splitting the data again using the median of the lower half and the median of the upper half. That's the way if I put it into a TI calculator and I typed in the right commands, it would do it. You would get different answers doing it the method that they suggest in the book. Truthfully, their method probably works better when you have a much larger data set. I would say that the way that we're doing it for these smaller data sets that we're working with, I wish that it was the other way. But when I taught it the other way the very first time that we were using this new book, everybody was getting wrong answers and I didn't know why. And then I went and tried the problem and I got wrong answers. And I realized that their method versus my method gave different answers. So again, I'm gonna teach you the way it is in Cengage because that's the book we're using. But I understand if you learned it differently in the past and you feel like this isn't the right way to do it, I'm kind of torn. I think that this, there's value in this method, but I think it's much more difficult and I would prefer to teach it the other way, to be honest. That being said, when we have everything arranged smallest to largest to find Q1, all we're going to do is find which X is in position 0.25 times N plus 1. The problem is if we get a decimal answer for that, we have to see it as going that distance towards the next data point. And that's really where students get tripped up. If you get a whole number of value that it returns, we just look in that location, it's not so bad. Same idea for Q3. Q3 is the value in position 0.75 times n plus 1. If that formula gives you a whole number, it's as easy as the median was. If that formula gives you something other than a whole number or a decimal, you really have to follow along with the steps here. So, Let's go back to this example data set now. They tell us that this data set, which is in order from smallest to largest, is 2, 5, 6, 10, 14, 15, 15, 18. There's eight data points here. I think we used it previously in the measures of center when we found the median. We said that with eight data points, eight plus one over two is 4.5. So we're looking between the fourth and fifth data point. Fourth and fifth are 10 and 14, which we add together to get 24. 24 divided by 2 tells me that the median is 12. Now that we have the median, we want to calculate Q1 and Q3. To calculate Q1, we do 0.25 times 8 plus 1, which becomes 0.25 times 9, which is 2.25. The 2 is not so bad. The 2 is the location of the start of the formula for finding Q1. So 2 means the second data point. If I count over, 1, 2, 5 is the second data point. So to find Q1, I'm going to start by putting down 5. The tricky part is I then need to take whatever decimal there is and say plus that decimal towards the next data point. 
In our case, the next data point is just six, so since that's one more, this becomes 0.25 times six minus five, or 0.25 times one. So I get back to 5.25. That's not necessarily gonna always happen. If instead it was between six and 10, for instance, I would start at six and then go 0.25 the distance 10 minus six. So it's not 0.25 times one, it's only one in this case because the next data point is six and six minus five is one. A lot of numbers throwing around here, I promise the best way to learn this is trial, go to the classwork page, try a few problems like this, get a little confused, then see me do it out on the whiteboard so that you can kind of understand the process of finding where those Q3 and Q1 are from the initial position plus a movement towards the next data point. That said, same general idea follows for this upper quartile of Q3. We use the formula that says 0.75 times n plus one, in this case, eight plus one. That tells me 6.75. I need to read that as start at the sixth data point and add 0.75 towards the seventh data point. So if we start at the sixth data point, one, two, three, four, five, six, 15 is our sixth data point. But our next data point is also 15. So when we go to do the formula, we do 15 plus 0.75, our next data point 15, minus our current data point 15. Since this term goes to zero, we're just left with our original data point 15. That said, if these weren't the same number, if it was like 15 to 18, then instead we would have got 15 plus 0.75, 18 minus 15, and we would have been adding to that 15 when we found Q3. In the end, doing all these calculations got us to a Q1 value of 5.25, a median or Q2 value of 12, and a Q3 value of 15. That leads us into our five number summary. So here, all we're doing for the five number summary is we're taking the three values we found on the last page, Q1, median, Q3, and we're adding in the minimum and maximum. Minimum and maximum being the smallest number on the list and the largest number on the list. So they go in ascending order whenever you're doing the five number summary, the minimum must be the lowest value in the data set. Two, in this case, Q3 has to be larger than the lowest value, or it could be tied technically if you just had like 10 twos to start out your data set, it could be both the lowest and Q1, but it can't be lower than the minimum. So these have to be either in ascending order or tied for what came before. So two is the minimum, Q1 is 5.25, median is 12, Q3 is 15, and then the last part of the five number summary would be finding the largest number, which in this case is 18. That's the max, which goes as the fifth number in the five number sum. So the five things we're looking for are the minimum or smallest value, the Q1 value, the way that we calculated on the previous slide, the median value, the Q3 value, the way we calculated on the previous slide, and then the largest value in the data set or the maximum. I'm asking you guys to take a second, maybe pause the video, see how far you can get trying to find the five number summary of these numbers, 0, 5, 9, 15, 20, 22, and 30. Here would be the answer to that. Where I want to begin is by counting how many data points I have, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If I do the median formula, 7 plus 1 divided by 2 gives me 8 divided by 2 or 4. That tells me that the median is in the fourth position. One, two, three, four. 15 is in the fourth position, so 15 is my median. When I go to find the position function for Q1 and Q3, there's good news. Whenever you have something that add one, when you add one to it, I should say, when you have a number of data points that adding one to it makes it a multiple of four, this will return exact data points. If instead of a multiple of four, you have an odd number, that's when it's gonna be the most difficult when you're gonna get decimals that you have to move in either direction of. That said here, sorry, here when I do seven plus one, I get eight. Eight times 0.25 is two. So this tells me Q1's in the second position. The second position is this data point five. So five is our Q1. 
So Q3, I do 0.75 times N plus 1. 0.75 times 8 gives me 6. If I count over to the 6th position, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 22 is in the 6th position. That means that my Q3 is 22. So our five number summary in this case would be zero for the smallest data point. Q1 should be five, not six. Apologies, that's a typo. Median should be 15. Q3 should be 22. And maximum should be 30, the largest data point. What I can then do with these five number summaries is create a box plot. I'm going to actually go over to the whiteboard just to show you step by step how to create these box plots. But basically, I fit a scale to the bottom. I draw lines at each of Q1, median, and Q3. I connect those to make a box. Then I draw lines at each of the max and the min, and I connect them to my box. So you're about to see me do it on the whiteboard where I'm going to take our first example, our second example, and make a box plot for each of them. So give me one second, let me just flip on the light here so it's easy to see. Maybe that's too much light, let's go with that. So when I go to create my box plot from this five number summary, basically I start by creating a scale along the bottom. I want this to be a consistent scale, I don't just want to choose the numbers that are in my five number summary. Instead I want to look at the smallest number and the largest number and create a reasonable scale that would include both. So if I'm trying to go between 2 and 18, I'm going to start at 0 and go by 5s. 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. That way, the largest number on my scale is larger than the maximum. The smallest number on my scale is smaller than the minimum. They could be equal to the maximum and minimum, but you don't want to have it so the max or min is beyond the last number on your scale in either direction. When I now go... To put in Q1, 5.25 is slightly to the right of 5. Median of 12 is to the right of 10. And Q3 is right above this line of 15. I'm then going to make a box where when you see one of these boxes in a box plot, that's the middle 50% of the data I was talking about earlier. This is the median within the middle 50% of the data, but this is my inner quartile range, my Q3 minus Q1. It's represented by the box in the middle of a box of whiskers or box plot, whichever you'd like to call it. 2 and 18 are my min and max, so I'm going to put a line here around 2, a line here around 18, and connect them to my box. There's a somewhat complicated formula that lets you know whether something's an outlier or not. Basically, if I take the IQR or interquartile range, which in this case would be 15 minus 5.25, so it would be about 9.75. If I multiply that by 1.5 and then go that far to the right of the box, that far to the left of the box, anything beyond that would be considered an outlier. I do not need you to understand that formula. I just need you to understand that sometimes in a box plot you might see something like this. That indicates that there is one data point further away from the center of the box plot and that that data point is an outlier by the formal definition of an outlier. So I don't need you to know that definition. I don't need you to calculate whether something's an outlier or not, but I do need you to recognize that when they have these points outside the box, they're meant to represent that they qualify as outliers. When I go to do example two over here, really I'm gonna change this back because I realize there's a typo throughout. Let's call that five like it should have been. That said, again, I'm gonna make a naturally occurring scale. For this one, the smallest thing I see is zero, the highest thing I see is 30. So I'm gonna go by tens from zero to 30. Zero, 10, 20, 30. So now that I have my scale, I wanna fit Q1, median, Q3. Q1, 5 is right between 0 and 10. Median, 15 is right between 10 and 20. And Q3, 22 is slightly to the right of 20. I'm going to connect these into a box. Once I've made that box, now I can put in the minimum of 0. 
and the maximum of 30. Connect them to the box, and my box plot is done. One thing I wanna point out about these box plots is when I ask you to do them for your Excel project, I basically just tell you to do them by hand instead. When I've tried to do them in Excel, I get these vertical box plots that aren't on the scale that I would like, and I know there's ways to do it that are slightly more complicated, as there are with the histogram, but really my goal with that project is just to get you used to how you use formulas within Excel, how you can make quick graphs. So in the end, I decided to tell students that they could just turn in something done by hand instead of going through the whole Excel thing. And eventually all students just preferred to do it by hand, so I made it in the assignment to do it by hand. If you wanna try and tackle it and do this box plot in Excel for the project, have at it, I'll definitely be able to give you credit for it. But really where I want you to use this process in the class is for making by hand the graph for the box plot from your data, from your quantitative data point in your project. Excellent.